can see the answer choices are covered up. That is by design. We do this so that the answer choices don't guide or dictate your thought process so that you don't see an answer choice that you are unfamiliar with and panic as you're trying to answer that question. After that, we'd like to begin with the lead-in, which is the last sentence or the question itself. And we do that because we want you to know what the test writer is asking prior to reading that vignette so that you can pick up on all those relevant clues without having to reread that question on test day. So let's take a look at that lead-in now. Which of the following is the mechanism of this patient's most likely condition? Which of the following is the mechanism of this patient's most likely condition? After that, we'd like to ask our students how many steps they believe this question will require. An example of a one-step question could be where you're asked for the diagnosis. An example of a two-step question is when you're asked for the treatment for a diagnosis. An example of a three-step question is when you're asked for the mechanism of action for a treatment for a diagnosis. A 45-year-old woman comes to the emergency department because she feels like her heart is beating out of her chest. She says she has experienced this a few times before, and episodes usually resolve within one minute. Her baseline physical examination is normal, but during the assessment, she develops dyspnea, dizziness, and palpitations. During this episode, her pulse is 160 per minute and regular, and blood pressure, uh, 160 per minute and regular, and blood pressure is 132 over 70. The ECG rhythm strip is shown. Which of the following is the mechanism of this patient's most likely condition? I want all of you to start thinking about the important clues in the vignette and lead in as I hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this lead in uh, and the vignette, okay? So starting off with this question, uh, this clinical question, the first thing we're given are demographics. This is a 45 year old woman. And oftentimes in these clinical questions, that's the first thing you're going to be given. So you want to make note of that because that can automatically help clue you in as to what kind of things you need to be thinking about. Okay. And then they'll often tell you, you know, why is this patient coming into the hospital? Why are they being seen by the physician? And in this case, it's because she says her heart is beating out of her chest. Okay. So that's what we call presenting signs and symptoms. And you want to make note of that because that's what brought them in and probably playing a role into the rest of the vignette. Okay, so when we hear something like this, we want to know more about it. How many times has it happened before? Um, does it come and go? How long does it last? Um, and, and we're given some of that information in this vignette. So you want to make note of that and highlight that. Okay, then obviously with this cardiology um, vignette, you know, the physical exam is going to be important as well. So the vital signs, the EKG, um, physical exam findings, and they tell us about something that happens during her physical exam assessment. Okay, so kind of something irregular happening there as well. Now this question is then asking us about the mechanism of the patient's most likely condition. So I think we've got a couple steps here. I think one, we've got to figure out what is this most likely condition, and then two, what is the mechanism of that most likely condition? Okay, so I think we've got a nice two-step question here. So let's move on to the next slide and we'll kind of blow up that EKG for you guys so you can get a good look at that. Don't worry, it will still be on the next slide. So uh, we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at the answer choices. And you know, when we work with students, we recommend that they actually, as they go through the answer choices, that they start at the bottom and work their way up to the top. So start with answer choice E and work your way up to answer choice A. And the reason we do this is because a lot of times we'll see students who start at the top, they'll select something they like as they go down without going through all the answer choices. So sometimes they'll get that question wrong. So we recommend doing it this way to prevent yourself from making that mistake. So we'll go ahead and go through these uh, one at a time, starting at the bottom. E, stimulation by the sympathetic nervous system. D, stimulation by the parasympathetic nervous system. C, re-entry circuit at the atrioventricular node. B, presence of an accessory pathway. And A, ectopic atrial foci. So we'll go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select what you think is the most likely mechanism behind the most likely condition here. And we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Forty-nine percent of you selected re-entry circuit at the AV node 
In second place, we had stimulation by the sympathetic nervous system. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is indeed C, and 49% of you got it right. So great job, everyone. Let me hand it back off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, great job, guys. So let's take a look at what's going on here. Um, we've got an EKG that is showing um, AVNRT, which is atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia. And I'll say that again, AVNRT, atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia. Okay, and what characterizes that is an EKG where you have a tachyarrhythmia or tachycardia, and we know this patient has that by the elevated heart rate, and also a narrow complex QRS. You can see that QRS is not a wide complex, it's pretty narrow, okay? On top of that, we can't see P waves. There are no dis discernible P waves on that EKG. We see a QRS and then we see a T, and then a QRS and then a T, and that continues, okay? And what's happening is that P wave is actually buried in the QRS complex. That's why we can't really see it, okay? What's happening is atrial activation is happening at the same time as ventricular activation. And that's because of a re-entry circuit, okay? So if we take a look at the next slide, this is kind of talking about some of those tachyarrhythmias, specifically AVNRT. So a re-entry circuit in the AV node depolarizes the atrium and ventricle almost simultaneously. So these patients present like they would with an arrhythmia, so uh, heart, uh, heartbeat racing out of their chest, palpitations, lightheadedness. And you can see that the patient has tachycardia and a P wave is often buried in the QRS, or you can see it shortly after that, okay? Which is what we saw on our EKG. So let's go back, let's take a look at our EKG and this vignette, and you can see that that's uh, kind of matches what we see there in our EKG, okay? The other choices are incorrect, okay? Um, in uh, a normal setting, the parasympathetic nervous system dominates, um, and if you were to have uh, excess stimulation by the sympathetic nervous system, that would lead to tachycardia. If you were to have excess parasympathetic stimulation, that would lead to bradycardia. Um, but again, you would have normal P waves, normal QRS, uh, normal EKG complexes. It would just be faster or slower heart rate. Uh, presence of an accessory pathway, that is consistent with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, um, and that's characterized by having a supraventricular tachycardia, where you have that delta wave, okay? And then lastly, answer choice A, ectopic atrial foci. That's where you have electrical activity areas outside of the SA node. So you kind of have what's called multifocal atrial tachycardia, and you would see P waves with abnormal morphology. We're not even seeing P waves here, so not the best answer. So great job on this first question. 